so yeah, so my name's Pete and I'm from uh, the Christian Union here up on campus. And as you may or may not know, this is a whole week of events we've got going. Lunch bars every day, in this room, same time, same free food, brilliant. And we've got Michael, who's down to speak to us all week, uh, every, every talk at the lunchtime and every evening event as well. So today, as you hopefully know, talking about uh, convince uh, science is very God. So I'll hand over to Michael. Fantastic. Brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you. Welcome. Um, this is the first of a whole week of events. So, uh, so you don't need to worry about lunch. We're going to sort that every day. And don't worry about lunch. We will make sure we're finished by 10 to, so you've got time to get out, grab lunch, have a look at the books, and chat before you head away to lectures. Um, but all week, we're going to be looking at some big life questions. Um, each evening, we're going to be thinking about some of the kind of existential questions about life as we think about things like identity and happiness and hope. And then each lunchtime, we're going to take some of the big questions and objections to the Christian faith and unpack them and give you plenty of opportunity to ask questions. There's going to be a number up on the screen throughout the talk. So any point during the talk you're thinking, I totally disagree with that, or what about this, or what about that, please text in and uh, we'll do our best to get through as many as possible. Obviously, we can't promise to get through them all, uh, but hopefully we can get through a few. And then we hope that this week also sparks off loads of conversations um, here and all over campus as you think about these things more. Um, so this uh, lunchtime, we're looking at this huge subject, convinced science has buried God. Are God and science incompatible? And certainly for a lot of people, that seems to be the case. That seems to be their opinion, doesn't it? Science and God belong in different categories, and you've got to choose either one or the other. I mean, it's either reason or it's faith. It's either kind of, you know, mysterious belief in some supernatural force, or you believe in uh, reason and science. And that's what a lot of people have said. People like Michael Onfray says, God puts to death everything that stands up to him, beginning with reason, intelligence, and the critical mind. Or Richard Dawkins, faith is an evil precisely because it requires no justification and it brooks no arguments. Or more humorously, Mark Twain put it this way, faith is believing what you know ain't true. So there's this kind of dichotomy that's presented to us. It's either faith or it's reason. It's either God or it's science. Now, it probably won't surprise you to think that I don't agree with that. And actually, I would say it's quite ironic that that's become the case, that we see this as a dichotomy, for several reasons. Just give you three, three very quickly. Firstly, because the modern study of science actually grew out of not an atheistic <coughs> worldview, but a Judeo-Christian worldview. Um, to quote C.S. Lewis, who died 50 years ago on Friday, he said, men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. Secondly, it's ironic to make this dichotomy because there are many Christians and theists and believers through history who've also been scientists, some famous, um, some not so famous. Uh, but certainly to say that you can't be a scientist um, and a Christian isn't borne out by reality. And thirdly, it's ironic to put this dichotomy up because actually over the years of scientific advancement, we haven't seen that as scientific advancement has grown, people's belief in God has decreased. Um, so someone did a survey back in 1915, and they asked a uh, wide selection of top-level scientists, what do you believe about God? Uh, do you believe in God? Uh, do you not? Or maybe you're not sure, an agnostic. And this is what it roughly came out as, a third um, in each category. And then in 1996, <coughs> they did a similar survey asking the same question of top-level scientists at the end of last century, and this is what they came out with almost exactly the same results. So after a century of scientific advancements, actually people's belief or not in God hadn't changed as a result. So I guess one of the questions is, why then is it seen as an issue? Why do people say today that science and faith are enemies opposed to each other, or that science has buried God? And I guess there might be some historical reasons. Um, if you look back in history, the history of science and the church, uh, you see people like Copernicus and Galileo and the historical conflict that appeared to be there between God and scientific advancements. And again, if you look more recently at things like Darwinian evolution, it seems again that Christi the Christian church and science are opposed to each other. Um, another reason why people might think this is because they think God is a kind of God of the gaps. Maybe you've heard of that terminology. Um, the idea that there are kind of gaps in our scientific knowledge and so we'll attribute to God the things that we don't understand. Okay? 
And it kind of traces itself back, actually, before Christian times to, to thinking of the people like the Greeks, who said, well, look, we don't understand everything, so we will attribute deity to the things we don't understand. You know, thunder and lightning, we don't know what it is. So let's say, for instance, there's some gods that are having a domestic in the clouds. And we'll say, that's how it happens. And we say, how primitive. We now know why things like that happen, and therefore we don't need God to do it. And so if you project that idea forwards, you might think, well, ultimately, science will have discovered so much, there will be no space left in which gods can exist in. We won't need God, because science will have discovered it all. So if God is just a God of the gaps, then God has a lot to be worried about as we discover more about science. Now, I don't know all of you, by any means, and I'm not sure where you're at in terms of this question. You might be here saying, um, I am convinced that God doesn't exist, and science is the reason why I have no time for Christianity. Well, thank you for at least coming uh, to listen to what I have to say and giving it a lunchtime shot. You might be saying, well, actually, I'm intrigued by Christianity. I'm intrigued by the Christians I see around me and the faith they have. But how could I ever seriously consider the claims of Christianity and also take seriously my studies as a scientist? Or maybe you're here as a Christian, but actually even as a Christian, you're thinking, how does my... Uh, belief in God fits with my study of science? Do I have to kind of live with um, a kind of dichotomy on my own brain between Sundays and weekdays? How does that fit together? So we probably all come to this question with different backgrounds, but it's a really important question, isn't it, um, to look into. And so let me just say three things in regard to this uh, before we open it up to questions. And the first I'd say is this. Um, looking for God in the gaps would be the wrong place to look for him anyway. Don't look for God in the gaps. What do I mean by that? Um, let me try and illustrate, okay? Um, you've probably all seen, and perhaps you've all used one of these, a Dyson Airblade. I've noticed that Bath University haven't splashed out on them yet. Um, they still have those pathetic ones that take five minutes to dry your hands. But in some universities I've discovered, sorry to this your university, um, they have Dyson Airblades. And I remember the first time I discovered an Airblade. It was so exciting, okay? Because I was like, wow, I've heard that they dry your hands in 10 seconds. So I actually got my iPhone out and timed it. And then I actually washed my hands again just to see if it was a fluke. And I worked out it actually works. They do dry your hands in 10 seconds. So I think these are pretty cool. And I, because I have a kind of slightly small mind, think, well, I can't understand how on earth a Dyson Airblade could work so effectively. How could it dry your hands so quickly? Now, I noticed it's called a Dyson <coughs> Airblade. So I figure there might be some being called Dyson out there. And so I was trying to work out, where is this Dyson being? And I thought, maybe, just maybe, Mr. Dyson is a little man who lives inside each one of those air blades. And when I come along, he, I don't know, he runs around and sucks very hard or blows very hard or something, and he just manages to make it work, because I can't work out how it works. Now, of course, you know that's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, here's Mr. Dyson. Uh, Mr. Dyson is 65 years old. There he is using one of his air blades. And uh, he's made so much money out of his air blades and his vacuum cleaners, he's now got a wealth of over £1 billion, pounds, apparently. Uh, so he's doing pretty well out of uh, his air blades. But just because I can't understand how it works doesn't mean that I attribute Mr. Dyson to the internal workings of the machine. And just because I might then work out how it works doesn't mean I therefore don't need a Mr. Dyson. The mechanism of the machine and the creator are not competing explanations but complementary ones, aren't they? They fit together. And so just as I don't find Mr. Dyson inside the air blade, so actually a Christian worldview says this, you won't find God inside his creation. As if, like, you know, as Christopher Hitchens once said, God has run out of justifications because our greatest telescopes and microscopes haven't found him. Well, that's looking for God in the gaps, isn't it? Looking for God within his creation. And actually understanding the mechanisms of science doesn't necessarily remove the need for a cause behind it. Which is why, actually, as many scientists through history have discovered more things about science, they haven't, therefore, referred to the fact that now we don't need God. Um, take Isaac Newton, for example. Uh, when Isaac Newton discovers and writes about the law of gravity, he doesn't say, now I've discovered gravity, I don't need God. He says, well, he writes a book called Principia Mathematica, and in it he says, I'm going to encourage the thinking person to believe in God. So for him, understanding... The mechanism didn't remove the need for the cause, but gave him greater appreciation. You see, if God is not in the gaps, but God is the God of the whole show, 
an understanding more about how the whole of creation works. It doesn't say, I don't need God, but gives me a greater appreciation for the God who made it. Both as I understand more and more of the intricacy of this world and its magnitude as well. Because it is incredible, isn't it? I was listening uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was in Serbia listening to a professor of physics from Germany, one of Germany's top professors of physics, uh, a guy called Thomas Schimmel. And um, he was speaking about this, and he gave a couple of examples which just blew my mind uh, as a non-physicist. Um, uh, first of all, um, he drank. Now, I wanted to get water, but I couldn't find water apart from in the bathroom, and I thought it might not be safe to drink. So this is orange squash. So discount the uh, small amounts of orange squash. Um, but he drank some of some water, which I'm going to do now, which, if my calculations are right, are about 18 grams um, of water. And he said, how many molecules of water have I just ingested into my being? The answer is 6,022 times 10 to the 23 molecules of water which you're thinking is just a big number, isn't it? But then he said, imagine, try to imagine what, what that is looking like, okay? So he said, get each of those water molecules and place them out in one square millimeter spaces on a road, okay? And space them out on a road that goes from here to the moon, each molecule in a square millimeter on that road. He says, not only will that road reach the moon, but how wide would that road have to be to enclose all of those water molecules that I have just drunk? He said it would have to be four times wider than it's long. That's how many molecules. It's incredible, isn't it, when you think of the intricacy of our world. But then think of the magnitude of it. How long does it take for light to get from the moon to the earth? One, one and a half seconds. Uh, from the sun to the earth? 8.3 minutes. How long does it take for light to cross our galaxy? 100,000 years. And our galaxy with its 100 billion stars is one of 100 billion galaxies. You know, I just, you know, just think, that's incredible, isn't it? And when I look at those things, I don't say, now I've understood more about the universe, its intricacy and magnitude, I don't need God. But as a Christian, it would give me a greater appreciation of the God who created it all. So that's the first thing. Don't look for God in the gaps. But here's the second thing. Naturalism could also be an obstacle to science. Now what do I mean by that? People often say historically it's been theists that have opposed scientific advancements. But actually, could a naturalistic worldview, one without God, also prevent barriers and obstacles? Uh, There's a philosopher called Alvin Plantinga who developed what he has coined the phrase of um, the evolutionary argument against atheism. It's a very interesting argument. You think, what? (laughs) Um, Normally it goes the other way, right? But he says the evolutionary argument against atheism. He says if evolution is true and the only explanation for life and everything, the only explanation, nothing but that, then why do we talk about truth? Because he says actually the mechanism that that drives evolution is survival, not truth. And so if we are the end result of a mindless, unguided process, why should we trust the products of our minds to tell us truth? Now you might say, well, he's a Christian philosopher, so he would say that. Well, listen to what John Gray says, who's certainly not a Christian. He said, modern humanism is the faith that through science, humankind can know the truth and so be free. But if Darwin's theory of natural selection is true, this is impossible. The human science mind serves evolutionary success, not truth. Or Thomas Nagel, professor in uh, New York University, said, evolutionary naturalism implies that we should not take any of our convictions seriously including the scientific world picture on which evolutionary naturalism itself depends. Or go back to someone like Charles Darwin, who wrote in one of his letters a very honest and interesting confession, but then with me the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of lower animals, are of any value at all or trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? You see what they're saying is, if you're saying that Darwinian evolution is the only explanation for everything, our biology, our biography, and everything, that actually undercuts the atheism which people often draw out of it. Um, I'll show you a funny video clip in a second. Um, this is uh, a clip by John Cleese. Um, it's not a Christian video at all, but I think it just it asks this interesting question of when we take this to not kind of its 
outworking and consistent conclusion, what you end up with is, is something like this. Um, so just enjoy uh, for a couple of seconds. I'm not going to buy the full version. There we go. Hello. We scientists have now located a gene which we scientists believe gives people the need to believe in God. In other words, this God gene releases chemicals into our body which create the impression that there is meaning in the universe. And this God gene is just here between the gene which we scientists now know makes us eat coconut ice cream after a fish dinner and this gene here which causes people with weak egos to grasp around desperately for simple explanations. Now, the discovery of this God gene is a big step forward in our quest to show that every bit of human behavior can be explained away mechanically, because we've now <coughs> also located the gene which makes some people believe that every piece of human behavior can be explained away mechanically. <laughs> and it's here, right next to the gene that makes you go to see Nicolas Cage movies, so that's a puzzle solved. And right under this gene, which can cause you to forget that since the 1920s, quantum physics has destroyed forever the idea that everything can be explained mechanically. Now, the gene which causes us to forget this obvious fact is very dominant in some people, especially me. And we scientists now know that it's closely linked to this gene here, which gives you such a weak sense of self that you hang on to anything that makes you feel more secure emotionally, whether it's fundamentalist religion or a reductionist view of the universe, which is right over this gene here that makes you want to punch people in the head when they take the scientific process and subject it to their pathological literal mindedness. <laughs> Thank you, I need it. <clears throat> and by the way, we now know that there is a gene that causes you to say, Thank you, I needed that, just there, when you were punched in the head. <laughs> Brilliant. So there's John Cleese. Um, and I hope you don't think I'm taking the mick out of the whole subject. Um, there we go. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, but actually, he raises an interesting question, doesn't he? Which is, says, actually, if you take that to its logical conclusion, then it can start to undermine itself. Um, another thing that's worth saying on this is interesting. The theory of the Big Bang, um, if you go back 100 years, a lot of people would have said, the reason why we don't need God is that the universe has always existed. Um, it's always been here. And then, well, this was the guy, uh, the first guy, um, to suggest that it wasn't the case, that the universe is expanding. Uh, he was um, a Belgian guy, Georges Lemaitre. Does anyone know that I've got that pronunciation right? I'm kind of making it up, but I just said it confidently, hoping that I got it right. Uh, but it's this guy. And this guy said, actually, the universe may not have always existed. Maybe the universe is expanding. And the theory of the Big Bang was put forward. Now, he was um, tutored by a guy in Cambridge called Sir Arthur Eddington, who was an atheist. And this is what he said when he heard, first heard the idea about the beginning to the universe. He said, philosophically, the notion of a beginning of the present order of nature is repugnance. I should like to find a genuine loophole. Because actually for him, with his naturalistic worldview, the idea of beginning to the universe was a big problem. And so actually, the theory of the Big Bang wasn't mostly opposed by theists, as we might expect, but often by atheists who realized that this would raise big questions. Uh, John Lennox, professor of mathematics um, at the University of Oxford, said, it's rather ironical that in the 16th century, some people resisted advances in science because it seemed to threaten belief in God, Whereas in the 20th century, scientific modes of a beginning were resisted because they might increase the plausibility of belief in God. So you see, this thing can cut both ways, can't it? So naturalism also could be, potentially, a hindrance to science. And then this is the third thing I just want to say. Um, there can be more than one way to know things are true. And science is obviously, in the scientific method, a very good way of discovering truth. But the problem comes when we start to say it's the only way to know truth. Uh, that goes beyond science into what we might call scientism. An arrogance that says that all other fields of knowledge are somehow redundant. Well, Bath University obviously has a very good and reputable science department. 
it doesn't just have a science department, does it? There are other departments here showing that actually the way to discover truth can be through the scientific process, but there are other ways too. There are ways that we can know truth through mathematics that you can't prove scientifically. I mean, my maths isn't great. Minus 2 plus 2 equals naught. I worked that one out. But you can't kind of prove that scientifically, can you? You can't get a kind of field with minus 2 cows in it and add 2 cows to end up with no cows. It doesn't work. It's a mathematical truth. And then there are historical truths. Truths that happened in history that are not repeatable, in the sense that you couldn't kind of recreate it and see if it's going to happen again. But we know because we can look through historical methods and the, the disciplines of history to discover whether they happened or not. And I would have to say, this is really important when it comes to the question of God, particularly as a Christian. Because as a Christian, my conviction and my belief in God doesn't just stem from philosophical ideas or scientific ideas, but primarily it stems from the fact that in the Christian claim, God stepped into human history in the person of Jesus Christ. And so my greatest reason for believing in God and being a Christian is actually the historical evidence for the person of Christ, his life, death, and resurrection. Now, you might be already kind of tuning out at this point and saying, yeah, whatever. Well, tomorrow we're going to look at the evidence for the New Testament and the person of Christ. So do come back for that. And on Friday evening, we're going to think particularly about the claim of the resurrection. Most people who deny these things as ridiculous haven't done so because they've investigated it, but because actually sometimes they haven't. So I would encourage you to come along. But it's important because if we're saying that science has got rid of God, it dismisses the fact that actually the greatest claim towards God's existence is that God potentially has walked and lived on planet Earth. And if he has, the way to investigate that will be through using <coughs> historical methods of investigation and looking at the person of Christ ourselves. One of those is sitting on your desk, by the way. It's a copy of Uncover, and it's one of the accounts of Jesus' life, written by a medical doctor and a historian. And we're encouraging you this week to take those away. They're free of charge. You can have them and you can read them alongside the talks that are going to be going on this week, just to take the time to investigate and ask yourself the question about whether this might be true and what might be in it. But before we go to questions, I'm just going to ask my colleague Gareth uh, to come up. Um, Gareth studied science, he loves science, um, he's also a Christian, I'm just going to ask him in a minute to tell us how that works together. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so I'm not working as a scientist now, I like to consider myself a sort of non-practicing scientist. Um, I, have, uh, I studied um, psychology and zoology down the road uh, in Bristol. Uh, yes, you're right, that is a weird combination, uh, and yes, I can talk to animals. Um, but <laughs> test me out later. Um, but basically, I, when I went to university, when I uh, first arrived in Bristol, I wasn't a Christian, and so while I was there, um, I was kind of confronted with this idea of um, is there really a God, um, and all the kind of questions that go along with that. And so I had to really think through this question: um, is can can you be a scientist and a, a good scientist and be a Christian and believe um, the stuff that we've been talking about? Um, I think I, I realised that there were basically two ways of looking at the world. Either there was this world where there's no God, or there's a world where there is a God. And I had to work out which of those kind of ways of talking about the world was, was true. Um, so that when I went into the lab and was looking down a microscope, or when I was uh, kind of watching people and how they behaved and stuff, did my explanations include um, a kind of bigger picture of there being a God who made everything and, and um, gave meaning to things, or should he be absent from my explanations? And I guess basically I, I realised that it, it comes down to what Mike was just saying, who is Jesus? Because if Jesus really is who Christians claim him to be, then it kind of clinches all of those questions. It answers the question, is there a God? Because if Jesus is God, then there is a God. Um, and lots of other questions as well. And I found that actually, particularly as a psychologist, that um, the the sort of way that uh, the, the Bible, the Christian worldview, uh, talks about human nature and why humans are as we are and uh, why we behave as we do, I found that a much better explanatory framework for the way that I look at certainly human behavior than, than anything else. And I think the same is true um, in biology as well, that um, the, as Michael was saying earlier, the kind of naturalist ways of talking about biology get you some way, but then actually there are lots more questions that arise from that, uh, which I think only, um, only a view of the world which includes, um, includes God can actually help you to get to. Brilliant. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Gareth. And um, talk to him later if you want to ask him more. Um, we're going to go to questions in 30 seconds. Um, so that's your cue to text into the number if you've not already. And um, just before we go to questions, let me mention two things. Firstly, there is a bookstore that's going to be outside the door. And uh, just to your left, the food will be to your right. Um, there's a whole load of books there. The ones that might be of particular interest would be this, by John Lennox, the uh, professor, professor of mathematics at Oxford, who has debated Richard Dawkins on several occasions, God's Undertaker, Science Buried God. So we'd really encourage you um, to check that out if, uh, this interest, if this area is of particular interest. Or if you don't want to read um, that, um, then you can read something in half the time, well, less than half the time, about half an hour, this little booklet, um, also by a, another scientist called Has Science Disproved God? Um, the books on the bookstall are all reduced down to the cost of a pound, uh, especially subsidised this week, if you're a guest of the CU. If you're a member of the CU, they cost a bit more. Um, and if you leave the CU to get the cheap books, then that's not advisable. Um, but do have a look at the books. Uh, booklets are 20p. Um, and also, just while we're doing the Q&A, it would really help us um, to leave some comments. There's loads of feedback forms on your desk. Hopefully there's enough for one each. And you could leave us some comments. And all week, if you're wanting to find out more about this, as well as what's happening this week, there's going to be a course called Uncover, where you can come and ask those questions and investigate more after this week is finished. You could just say, tell me more, and leave us your name and your number. Um, but if you just want to leave us comments anonymously, you can do that, OK? Um, but if you want to find out more, then just tick the box and leave us your details. And someone will whip around and clap those in before they get left for the next lecture in here. OK? Um, but brilliant. Have we got questions? So, yeah, I'll tell you what, Fantastic. Well, just take one minute just to fill in those forms if you could. And okay. I'll, I'll just show Mike the, the questions and we can... Okay, um, so grab that now, fill us in, and then we'll have a few questions in a second. Have you been reading this again? Yeah, yeah. I think there are some that would be better. I'll let you just read them out, okay? If you don't want to have a look. There are some that I think. Yeah, pretty much just that was there. I'll be uh, okay. Okay. Oh, well, honestly, I think it's just to give you more. And also, to I have been taking tests. Okay, um, we'll take the questions from the text first if we can. Um, if you've not got any credit or any reception, next the phone next to you. Is that all right? Um, we're slightly limited on time, sorry. Um, but uh, we'll do as many as we can um, for now, if, if that's okay. Um, but, uh, but there'll be myself and some of the team that will be outside later. Um, so if you're not rushing off to a lecture, please do stay and chat. We'll have to vacate this room, but... Uh, we're not wanting to limit your questions, we just recognise people might need to get away. Cool. Let's get going. So, first question. You note uh, that the ratio of believers has not gone down over 100 years of advancing science. But why, since Christians have been evangelising and science has actually become more fantastic and less understandable by the layman, has the ratio not gone up? Um, good question. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's interesting that is a study of scientists, not of the general population. Okay? So this is a study of people um, in different fields of, of science um, during those two points at the beginning and end of last century. Um, so it's not saying that the ratio of Christians in the world, or in Britain at least, have stayed static. I'm just saying amongst the scientific community. Um, why has it not changed? Um, I guess you might argue that maybe Christians need to work harder in sharing the message of Christianity in the scientific field. And certainly I've got friends who are scientists who are seeking in their scientific studies to, to honour God in that and also share what they believe as a result of that. Um, but I guess it also may make us realise that there may be other factors that are at work in whether or not we believe the claims of Christianity or believe in God. Sometimes we think it's only intellectual uh, but maybe there are actually moral issues deeper in our hearts that actually are the real reasons why we might be using these things more as sometimes possibly an excuse and not to really investigate it. So maybe science isn't really the issue. Maybe there's other issues at play beneath the surface. Okay, Good cool. question, though. Thanks. Yeah. Why does Plantinger assume that there is no correspondence and or correlation between survival and truth? Certainly, if we define truth <coughs> as that which is real, 
the organisms most likely to survive will be those that are adjusted to reality, hence true. Um, I guess he's saying that, um, and if you Google Alvin Plantinga, um, the evolutionary arguments against atheism, you can see a whole lot more. There's about an hour lecture that he's done on it. So I'm aware I've given you like 30 seconds, which is really unhelpful, probably just enough time to raise questions and not enough time to answer them. So do Google that and uh, have a look yourself. Um, I guess because the reality is um, to survive, sometimes uh, the truth isn't always the most helpful thing. And sometimes maybe actually um, avoiding the truth might be more beneficial for my own personal survival. Uh, possibly that could be argued the case. Um, so actually, it may in some situations be beneficial to survival, but it doesn't guarantee that it's going to be beneficial to survival in all situations. And, and I think that's what he's maybe raising. But do Google it, because I think he will explain it a whole lot better. Okay, cool. So Sorry. What do you think an eyeball is for? Why do we have eyeballs? They tell you information about the world and you survive because you can see a person about to eat you. So okay. Why, why is it bad to perceive reality? When is it good to, to not believe it? Sorry? Saying? I don't understand what you're saying at all. Why is it good to not understand reality? Why is that survival advantage? Um, because in some situations, I think he's saying, I think there's a difference between perceiving reality and then finding truth about these bigger questions about life and God and the universe. Um, and I think he would distinguish between those two things and say, it's not just my perception that there is an object or something like that, um, but actually why in these bigger questions of life, um, why investigate them at all? What, what benefit do I get in terms of my survival for that? Please do Google it. I think he would explain it a lot better. Is that okay? Uh, yeah. Um, sorry, we sorry do, Peter. No, we'll stick with the text. Is that sorry. okay? Thanks, Peter. Um, um, but if you want to chip in, chat later, okay? Yeah. I know it's really frustrating. So much want to talk about we need to try and get through. So sorry. Mm -hmm. So um, Also, while Darwin's quote certainly implies that we cannot trust our own mm. conclusions, surely that can also be applied to belief in God as well as non-belief. I would argue that it points towards nihilism as the only sensible approach to life. Um, <laughs> I, and possibly so, yeah, which is why I was saying, you know, these quotes were always coming from, from Christians, and they certainly weren't necessarily just coming to a Christian conclusion from it. So you could uh, just end up with a kind of nihilistic approach um, to that, couldn't you? Um, and so I guess what he does is he raises a question which says, um, this doesn't necessarily mean we can trust the products of our minds or not. We don't know. Uh, so have we got anything else we can go on? Are there any other reasons to suggest we might be able to? Um, uh, is there any other explanation other than Darwinian evolution for life? Or is that the only thing we've got to go on? Um, is it a kind of, someone, my friend calls it a nothing buttery explanation. He says, to say that there is nothing but this as an explanation. Um, and I think actually, when you do that, you end up with quite a nihilistic view about life. But actually the reality is most of us don't live that way. And so there's a contradiction between the way we perceive the world and way, the way we live in the world, <coughs> and the natural consequences of where that world you might lead. Cool. I feel this text deserves being read out just because <laughs> someone actually managed to type this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How does the Christian image of the ma uh, the Christian image of man compare to the modern scientific view of man as an organism with a modus operandi of a transparent phenomenological <laughs> ph phenomenological self which emerges out of the physical neurocorrelates of consciousness and is the basis of all other experience? <laughs> <laughs> Great, well, well done. done. Did they spell it correctly? I'm intrigued to see I, if a um, predictive know. text could work that one out. <laughs> so um, I think the key, yeah, yeah, how does the scientific man compare with... Bill? I think that's a yeah. really good, good question. Um, and without getting to, to every detail of the question, um, tonight at the quiz night, we're actually going to look at the question of identity and value. And say, so actually, when we think about who we are as a human being, um, who are we as a human being? A naturalistic explanation... Uh, Francis Crick saying we were just a bunch of neurons. Um, is that satisfactory? Does that fit with our experience of life? Um, and so, so actually, are we more than just, you know, as Br Bertrand Russell said, a chance collocation of atoms? Do we actually have value that goes beyond that? And that's the question I'm asking. If we just have a naturalistic worldview, um, where do we attribute value, worth, significance? Um, where do we... Um, go to consistently when we work out things like human value, human rights, you know, things like that. So it's a really good question and we're going to explore that and we're going to have more time to discuss that tonight. So do come for that. Okay. 
thoughts? Any questions? Okay, there's, there's actually a couple that are kind of about the Bible, so I think maybe tomorrow, right, might be... Okay, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind that. of... Sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm just going to have to... Okay, let's go with this one. Okay, yeah. Isaac Newton had to talk about religion as funding, as his funding came from the church. How is his quote evidence if the church forced his hand in writing it? Um, Isaac Newton had to talk about religion because his funding came from the church. Um, I'd have to check out the details of that um, because I think it may be, well, I'd be sceptical to say that Isaac Newton's conclusions about theism and God were just because he wanted to secure funding from the church. I think I have a bit more respect for him than that, that he was just kind of saying these things uh, just to kind of keep the church happy. Um, Because certainly there have been plenty of people through history who have been willing to say things that didn't keep the church happy. Um, So so I'd have to look into that and question that. Um, But that's why I'm not just looking at someone like Isaac Newton. There are plenty of people like Francis Collins today who are committed Christians, who are high-level scientists, and don't have anything to gain in their scientific studies from saying, I'm a Christian. Okay? They've got no kind of, you know, no kind of ulterior motive in saying this is going to advance my scientific agenda, even if potentially in a previous generation it did. Sorry. Um, but I'm saying that Francis Collins, whether or not he's a Christian, that's not going to help him or not in terms of whether he's going to be able to get forward and advance as a scientist. We're saying in a previous generation, when the state church or the established church had a lot more power, um, then potentially some people felt a sense of, I've got to say this or I've got to say that to please them. I think I would say, certainly in, in the West today, there is nothing to gain um, in the scientific world saying, I'm a Christian, you might get some ridicule for it. Um, so to say that people are just saying those things um, because that's going to advance their scientific career possibly might have been true for some through history, but I don't think it would be true of uh, scientists who are also Christians today. Okay? Yeah. Sounds like the last question. So sorry. Um, how can someone believe in evolution and creation they completely contradict? Okay. Um, and... Um, there's one thing, if you, maybe you're here, I don't know where you're at kind of with Christianity. Maybe you're kind of looking into it. One of the things you need to know, okay, if you're going to become a Christian or even consider it, mm-hmm. is that the, there are Christians who have differences of opinion on different things, okay? Um, one of those differences of opinion is over the issue of the question of Genesis 1 to 3, the length of time of the creation, um, and exactly what mechanisms God used um, to bring about creation. So I know Christians, and I have Christian friends who are convinced that this is a young earth, and that God created it in six literal days as part of one week. I have other Christian friends who love Jesus, who um, respect the Bible as God's words, um, who would actually say, no, God used the process of evolution, and the earth truly isn't just a few thousand years old. And um, they both love Christ, they're both committed Christians, and they're friends of mine and they're friends of each other. So I think what I can understand from my experience and from looking into this is that I don't think as a Christian you've got to say, clearly, it's got to be this or it's got to be that. There are Christians that have different opinions. One of the reasons is that in the Bible, the Bible is a, basically a library of books, okay, 66 books, of different genres. Um, so we have something like Luke's Gospel, the ones on your desk, a kind of historical document about the person of Jesus. You've got books like Psalms, which are poetic books of songs. And then you've got Genesis, and the first few chapters of Genesis is a unique kind of genre when it comes to literature. And so Christians have wrestled with the question of, is this historical genre? Should it be taken literally, six literal days? Is it poetic? And the question of the genre of the literature is really important because then it obviously affects how we read that part of the Bible and in terms of how we reconcile that with our understanding of science. But certainly I'd have to say there are many, many Christians who have a really high view of the Bible and who love Christ, who also um, are um, evolutionary scientists and reconcile those two things. And so I don't think those two things have to oppose each other. They don't in their experience, they don't have to be in yours. Um, Of course, you can look into that more. A helpful little book by John Lennox is called um, Seven Days That Divide the World. And um, certainly small, you can get it on Kindle as well. Um, Really looking at that issue of how do Christians, how Christians historically um, sort to reconcile the early chapters of Genesis with their understanding of science. One of the interesting things is that the idea that the days in Genesis might not be literal 24-hour days was not put forward after Darwin's theory of evolution. 
But that was actually suggested more than a millennium before uh, by Christians. So their reading of Genesis was not a response to try and reconcile the Bible with Darwinian evolution, but it was already something that people had discussed and were open to, saying this may not be six literal days of a, a literal week, okay? Not just a response to try and keep squeezing the Bible into a science worldview. Guys, oh, thank you so tough. much. Oh. Um, do stay and share outside if you've got more. Um, and we're going to kind of pick up where we left off tomorrow. So, on that. so basically, you've got the two things on the feedback form, the tell me more and account me in. If you take either of those um, to tell me more, there's lots of opportunities to follow all your questions up after this week. So if you put that down, we'll, we'll be in contact with you as quickly as possible. To count me in. If you think you're, you've already committed your life to Jesus or, you, or you'd like to soon, then we'll also be in contact with you as quickly as possible as well. So now, if you want to talk to Michael, please feel free. Talk to your Christian mates. But if we could all quickly, but safely, <laughs> uh, move out there to have lunch.